Bartholomew Roberts maintained one of the most colorful and diverse pirate companies in history. Aboard his royal fortune were men from different nations, races and walks of life. However, it was far from egalitarian, nor was it a simple social structure. Every pirate was not equal. At the top of the food chain were the so-called House of Lords, including Roberts and his close lieutenants. Below them were the so-called commoners, meaning the pirates that had signed Roberts' articles, giving them the right to vote. Right above the bottom were the various artisans. Some had signed the articles, others had not. These included musicians, carpenters, surgeons and other such. At the bottom were essentially the secondary class citizen. They were forced into doing hard labor and were paid less, if anything. These included men who had been press ganged into service, landlubbers without sailing experience, and slaves. In this video I will cover all of the social casts of Robert's company, and also some of the specific characters in the crew. Let's start with the lowest caste of, essentially, second-class citizen. They lacked an official name, and Roberts considered them part of the commoners. They primarily consisted of white sailors, especially fishermen, that had been pressed into service. By the 1720s, piracy had become a dangerous and suicidal profession, which only a few desperate men willingly signed into. To maintain their way of living, pirates like Roberts had to force unwilling seafarers into his ranks. Considering what a narcissist he was, Roberts frequently claimed that he never forced a man into service, but we know this is false. At his trial, Henry Glaspie proved how he had been abused and wounded by the pirates into joining them. Glaspie and 73 other men were acquitted by the court. Many of them gave evidence against the other pirates. The forced men were made to sign the articles and were technically inducted into the commons. They typically refrained from the pirates' debaucheries, plundering and cruelty. However, some of them grew accustomed to the pirate lifestyle just like Roberts himself once had. One of them was a massive 20-year-old named John Walden. Thanks to his great strength, he was nicknamed Miss Nanny and described by one shipmate as a staunch pirate and a great rogue. The crew used Miss Nanny for lifting anchors and breaking locks. He could cut mooring cables with one blow and fought with Roberts until his final battle. Most of the forced men were less eager to stay in Roberts' crew and many tried to desert. Joseph Slinger jumped overboard and swam for hours until he reached the safety of land. But if the surgeons were caught, they were put on trial before a pirate council. During one such trial, all three deserters were flogged. Two were afterwards pardoned, but the third was marooned on a small islet. In another incident, two deserters were tied to the mast and shot dead. Robert's crew did not want landlubbers aboard a ship, since they were unskilled at sailing. However, at several occasions they recruited soldiers into the ranks. They were paid only a quarter share, either because of their lacking expertise, or because Roberts personally disliked them. Most of these soldiers had been garrisons in the various forts strewn across the West African coast, and had suffered poor wages, poor treatment and poor food. Then there's the question of black sailors in Roberts' crew. Some falsely state that Roberts was an egalitarian liberator of slaves, but he was definitely a hardcore racist. He had worked on a slave ship, and showed hard evidence of viewing them as commodities. Nonetheless, the aforementioned lack of recruits often forced him into recruiting blacks into his crew. However, most of them were, as a Danish eyewitness put it, French Creole Negroes, meaning French-speaking blacks that had been born in the Americas. They were accustomed to European customs, and could be given basic orders by any pirate that spoke rudimentary French. They were forced to fetch water, man the pumps and do other heavy labor for the pirates. In one instance, Roberts gifted 18 blacks to a rogue trader. Interestingly enough, one eyewitness points to Roberts recruiting African natives into his crew. Known as Gremitos, they were from the Crew tribe, native to Sierra Leone and modern Liberia. They were well known for their skill in handling long, seaworthy canoes, and would rather commit suicide than be enslaved. I don't know their status in Roberts' crew. The commons made up the backbone of Roberts' company. To become a member of Roberts' crew, you had to sign his ship's articles, which were a set of rules and regulations. This was evidence of you being a pirate, and in a court of law, essentially signing your own death warrant. It was a point of no return, and a full dedication to Robert's motto, a merry life and a short one. Indeed, Robert's crew were a mean bunch, known for their drunkenness and violence. When Roberts began to distance himself from their carousing, it is said that they started plotting against him. He was only able to hold sway over them using constant threats, eccentric charisma, and of course his never-ending success. For most of his career, the crew were quite proud of Roberts, and would boast about him to their captives, saying he was the greatest pirate there ever was. 
they gifted him silver and shinerware for drinking his tea. However, Robert still drank alcohol. He has been recorded as drinking small beer, and he once stole a corkscrew for himself. Hardly necessary if you only ever drink tea. In return, the crewmen had the right to vote in the various affairs of the ship. They would choose destinations together, and the fate of deserters and prisoners. They saw themselves as princes above men, and practiced their rights by openly carrying their weaponry. As for nationality, most of the commons were English or Welsh. Roberts had grown up in the Welsh countryside, and had a strong preference for his own countrymen. We know that he privately conversed with Howell Davis in their incomprehensible tongue, and likely did so with his new crewmates. Of the 52 pirates hung at Cape Coast, nearly half were Welsh or West countrymen, meaning Cornishmen. These lads would actually have said R to indicate yes, or as part of a sentence like, when are we eating? Most of the others were indentured servants or poor white colonists that had gladly joined Robert's desperados. There was also a split splash of other nationalities. One crewman was a Greek from Smyrna. However, Roberts forbade Frenchmen from joining his crew. Either the language or cultural barriers were too strong, but he did not discriminate against the disabled, be it physical or mental. Jean Fenn had only one hand, having lost it in Robert's service, but he didn't replace it with a hook. James White was a hunchbacked musician. Another dude was a half-witted fellow, ever in some monkey-like foolish action. Bartholomew Roberts employed a lot of individuals with specific skills aboard his ship. These included musicians, carpenters, surgeons, priests, and so on. Roberts employed musicians for two purposes. The first was to provide entertainment for the crew. His musicians were obliged to play every day, except for Sunday, when they were given rest. The second purpose was to play music during vaporing, his noisome tactic of scaring enemies into submission. As far as we know, all of Robert's musicians had been forced into service. One of them was Nicholas Brattler, a fiddler that had served aboard a slave ship. The other was the hunchback, James White. Surgeons were rarely desperate enough to join pirate crews willingly, so Roberts impressed several of them during his career. We know little about them, except for Peter Scudamore. He had been pressed from the same ship as James White. Like Roberts himself, Scudamore was arrogant but intelligent. Both were also Welsh. The two would become good friends and have many interesting discussions. Scudamore even signed the articles willingly and took a strong liking to the pirate lifestyle. He liked insulting prisoners, calling one a great rogue and hoping he would drown. He frequently stole surgical supplies to fulfill his needs. When the pirates were taken to court, Scudamore's abilities as a doctor gave him free run aboard a ship. Using a smattering of African languages, he managed to rally the slaves and pirates into mutiny. However, another surgeon revealed his plans, and Scudamore was put in chains. He was hanged on the 13th of April, 1722. Having grown up strictly religious, it is no surprise that Robert sought a minister to join his crew. He offered a Welsh reverend named Roger Price to join the crew and take a share of the booty. All he had to do in return was to say prayers and make punch. The reverend refused and was let go along with all of his stolen property. However, Roberts kept three of the reverend's prayer books and his corkscrew. He also told him that his men led a dissolute life, but he tried to keep them in order on Sundays at least. Religiosity in Roberts' crew seems to have varied. On their way to their trial, young Sutton, the master gunner, complained bitterly about being chained next to a pirate who was praying to go to heaven. Sutton responded, Did you ever hear of any pirate going to heaven? <laughs> Give me hell, it's a merrier place. I'll give Roberts a salute of 13 guns at its entrance. Sutton then made a formal complaint to have the pirate removed from his side, or his prayer book confiscated. The hardest and most experienced pirates of Roberts' company had formed themselves into what they called the House of Lords. Some of them were former captains themselves. They assumed powers not available to the rest of the crew, such as going a short will, walking the quarterdeck, and parlaying with the captains of prize ships. They referred to each other as my fellow nobles, and greeted each other as my noble lord. After the death of Howell Davis, it was this House of Lords which first debated who should be the new captain, before eventually electing Bartholomew Roberts. In other pirate companies, the crew were not bypassed in this manner. Valentine Ashplant was a Londoner, and the former captain of a brig. Aboard the Royal Fortune he was a sort of mixologist, able to prepare strong alcohol for the crew to enjoy. His favorite brew was rum fustian or rum bullion. It was prepared by mixing and heating up eggs, beer, sherry and gin, with brown sugar, cinnamon and nutmeg. Roberts had impressed a skilled navigator, Harry Glasby, to be his sailing master. 
Despite his skill, he was unpopular with the pirates due to his unfriendly attitude. He did not want to be a pirate after all. His only friend aboard was Valentine Ashplant. One day a pirate hit Glassby to the deck, having tired of him. Ashplant leapt on the offender and half strangled him. Sometime later, after Glassby tried escaping, the lords wanted to kill him. Only Valentine objected. When they didn't listen to him, he held a speech, after which he pulled out his brace of pistols and pointed them at his fellow lords. It made a convincing argument, and Glassby survived. Little David Simpson was a large man from North Berwick, recruited into Robert's crew from the sloop Philippa. He was made quartermaster after Thomas Anstis was given command of his own ship. Simpson was possibly elected, but it's likely that Roberts or the Lords chose him, since the crew disliked him as a pugnacious bully. Eventually they deposed him, but Simpson was always loyal to Roberts, and would often shout at prisoners what a great pirate his captain was. In one incident, the crew had captured a female passenger, Miss Trengrove, and Simpson vowed to safeguard her honor from the crew, meaning that he would protect her from any dirty hands. Over the next few days, he raped her three times. She later went to watch his hanging, to which he remarked, I have lain with that bitch three times, and now she has come to see me hanged. In the next few sections, I will cover two of the most prominent lords, that eventually became captains in their own right. When Walter Kennedy was captured in 1721, he was interviewed by the press about his life and views on piracy, and most of this script is based on his own words. He was 26 at the time of capture, and his father had been an anchorsmith in Wapping, he had fought in the navy, but having heard how the American pirates commanded entire islands, he coveted to be one of those petty princes. He joined an expedition to the Caribbean, and together with Howell Davis, mutineered and turned pirate. Kennedy was made quartermaster, and continued as such after Roberts was elected. He said of the pirate life that it was unhappy and wicked. They were always in fear, and whenever they saw another ship, they could only flee or fight. Kennedy was a brave fighter. He personally led boarding parties at Principe and against the Portuguese fleet in Brazil. At Brazil, Roberts attacked a fleet of 48 Portuguese ships, taking the wealthiest as a prize. Shortly thereafter, Roberts left his flagship and the prize ship behind to chase another target. When he returned, his flagship and the prize ship were gone. Roberts figured that Kennedy had deserted him with the ships and would never again trust an Irishman. However, it was likely a mistake. Since Roberts just vanished, Without a trace, Kennedy and the crew likely believed he had been captured. Rather than just sit around and do nothing, they decided to leave. The company split up, and Kennedy himself took the Portuguese prize and sailed back to Europe. The crew intended to disperse at Ireland, but thanks to Kennedy's poor navigational skills, were shipwrecked in Scotland. Most of the pirates were captured and executed, but Kennedy escaped. Later he set up a brothel in London and ran a sideline in burglary. However, one of his dissatisfied prostitutes informed that he was a robber. In prison he was recognized as a pirate and hanged. Thomas Anstis had been together with Kennedy and Davis when they mutineered and turned to piracy. After Howell's death, Anstis became one of Robert's chief lieutenants. He led multiple boarding parties to victory, wearing a yellow bandana as his trademark. Eventually, Roberts gave Anstis command over his own ship, the Good Fortune. However, Anstis grew tired of Robert's increasing tyranny. After Roberts assaulted a crewman over an insult, Anstis took his good fortune and slipped away at night. Thus began another brutal career of captaincy, marked by abuse and violence. In one incident, his crew gang raped and afterwards killed a female passenger. In spite of his violence, Anstis never amassed a fortune. His crew soon tired of piracy and drew up a petition to King George himself, asking for pardons and claiming that Roberts had forced them. Every pirate signed the petition in a so-called round robin, a circle of names, so that ringleaders couldn't be identified. Whilst waiting for Georgie to respond to their DMs, the pirates spent nine months on a tropical island near Cuba, eating rice with turtle, dancing and hosting theatrical mock trials. These sort of mock trials were also popular in prison. When it became apparent that Georgie was ghosting them, Anstis and the lads returned to piracy. Interesting to note about Anstis was that he twice captured superior ships to the good fortune, but refused to switch her out, since he was so used to handling and navigating her. Twice he managed to escape from navy warships. Eventually, however, his prisoners rose up and killed him. The good fortune was taken into Curacao, where the remaining pirates were hanged. Montigny La Palisse was never part of Robert's crew, but frequently sailed with him as a concert. 
Roberts and La Palisse met first near Barbados, shortly after Roberts had lost the Royal Rover and Sagrada Familia. Palisse commanded a small sloop, the Sea King, armed with six guns and 63 men. They took a few prizes together, until pirate hunters attacked, and Palisse decided to bail out. A few months later, Roberts returned to the Caribbean, being now in command of a more powerful ship. Palisse unexpectedly rejoined him, apologizing profusely for his cowardly retreat. Roberts decided to keep him around. In one attack they plundered 10,000 pounds worth in goods. Whilst Roberts' flagship was able to intimidate and batter enemies into submission, Pelisse's fast sloop was able to run down more nimble targets. Eventually they were separated by a storm. This might have been it before they miraculously linked up for it the third time. Once more they kept pirating successfully, Roberts probably carrying La Pelisse quite a bit. They were going to attack a Portuguese warship together, but Pelisse considered it too powerful and, again, ran away. Of course, La Pelisse and Roberts regrouped. Again. Palisse's sloop was so beat up at this point that he was given a new one. They sailed to South Carolina, where Roberts wanted to trade with an allied smuggler. They waited and waited, and eventually, La Palisse got tired of waiting and returned to the West Indies. Roberts was not so sorry to see him go. I've never seen La Palisse mentioned outside of his association with Roberts, and I've no idea what happened to him after his final desertion. Big thanks to my generous supporters over on Patreon. Cole Freer, Max Twick, 1660, Michael Jans, Rachel, Blunderbomb, Lockgar, and Dyer. If you want to support me monetarily, please check out the links to PayPal and Patreon in the description below. This is what helps me fund my research and make better videos. Otherwise, please give the video a like and a comment so the algorithm will spread it to more potential viewers. And why not share it with a friend? Cheers. If you want to learn more about early modern history, please check out my second YouTube channel. Baltic Empire. The most recent video covers apothecaries during the period, including what medicines would have been available to pirates. Also, like, subscribe, share with a friend, Baba Yaga. Cheers.